Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Beautiful and Bothered. If you are watching the video episode on the official Beautiful and Bothered YouTube channel, which you should subscribe to, yes, I am blonde now. I needed a change. I was debating doing it for a long time and actually super exciting. The day that this episode comes out, I am going to London for the very first time. It's not for work. My fiance and I are going with our best friends to London and this will be my very first time. I am so excited and I don't know why, but something about going to London really helped me pull the trigger going, um, platinum white blonde because I just kind of wanted to live my Draco Malfoy fantasy. So like I said, I'll be in London when this episode comes out for the week. So please feel free to hit me up, DM me about any London recommendations, things I need to do, places I need to go, places I need to eat, most importantly, because my life revolves around food. So today's episode is going to be a little different. We are not going to have any hot topics. We're going to dive right into our guest interview because it is fascinating. I'll be talking to renowned makeup artist Erin Parsons. I really knew her from TikTok. We followed each other. She makes the most amazing content. She collects Marilyn Monroe's makeup, all this vintage makeup, even from other stars, and always showcases these beautiful vintage looks and techniques. And my God, she's an amazing artist. So when I asked her to be on the podcast, she said yes. I was so excited. And when I really started to dive in and do research on her, I said to my fiance, um, babe, this uh, artist is a little bit of a bigger deal than I knew. And I quickly discovered her almost 30 year career doing editorials for Vogue covers, Harper's Bazaar, V Magazine, runway shows for some of the biggest designers in the world. She is the global makeup artist for Maybelline, has done most of the commercials you've seen. So I doubled down on my research. I wanted to know everything there was about her because I am so honored to have a conversation with someone like this. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. So without any further ado, let's dive in with today's special guest. Introducing my guest today is gonna make me run out of breath and potentially take your breath away, so buckle up. She is a renowned makeup artist known for her incredible work on models such as Bella and Gigi Hadid, Adriana Lima and Kendall Jenner, just to name a few. Her stunning editorial work has graced the covers of V Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, and Vogue, ever heard of them? Runway shows for designers such as Jason Wu, Christian Suriano, Jean-Paul Gaultier, and many more. She was appointed Maybelline New York's global makeup artist in 2017, and inspired by classic Hollywood cinema, her social media brings new meaning to the word innovative, sharing with us her love of vintage glamour, showcasing her vintage makeup and fragrance collections, creating breathtaking looks and hairstyles, and illustrating the history of centuries-old cosmetics formulas and techniques. A true artist I am beyond honored to speak with today, the one and only Erin Parsons. <laughs> That was amazing. That made me impressed by myself in a way. You should be. Oh, thank you. It's always nice to have that little reflection, right? Yeah, How are true. you? Yeah, I'm great. It's, it's Sunday. It's so funny when I booked this appointment with you, I didn't even think that it was Sunday. So I actually, instead of being in my office, which people are used to that backdrop, I'm at home and this is my vanity with like all my modern perfumes. All the vintage ones are oh. behind me in the mirror. So I didn't give you a new backdrop. <laughs> yes. Well, everything happens for a reason because now we get to peep that fragrance collection. <laughs> So I discovered you on TikTok and I've been following you for a long time. Your content is so different and unique in a very crowded beauty space that people are doing a lot of the same thing. So I want to start out by asking for those who don't know, where did your love of beauty begin? I mean, this is when I go into the Marilyn stuff. If people have been watching my TikTok, it kind of started with Marilyn Monroe because I just remember being like six years old. And seeing her and being like, that's the fantasy person, you know, that's, that's, it, it, she really made me dream. And then when I started to learn about her, it made me understand that, oh, well, she didn't come from a great childhood. So if she can make it, that gave me hope. But then it really, what I realized, it's, it's the beauty and the glamour and her makeup and the lipstick and the way that she used the, the, the facade in a way to create this icon. That's what made me really understand. Oh, you know, I saw Norma Jean and then I saw Marilyn. Oh, wait, makeup can do this for you. Dyeing your hair, the transformation of, of uh, using vanity to transform. And I started experimenting with, with makeup when I was literally six years old. I just stole my mom's makeup and would put it on and look crazy. But I fell in love with it that early in life. 
<laughs> I love that. No, because it was very similar where when I did theater, it was the same thing. I started to discover that transformational aspect. And I always say to people, when you're coming from an insecure place, I realize the exterior can have such an impact on the interior, working your way in, if you will. And I think Marilyn was such a quintessential representation of that. 100%. Yeah, that's... That's, that's why I had to buy all of her makeup. <laughs> I couldn't buy all of it, but what I could buy. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about that. So recently you did acquire pieces from Marilyn's actual makeup collection. This is product she literally wore. First off, I want to commend you for how incredible you are for respecting the pieces and preserving them and not swatching them, but trying to find similar products. So tell me about that experience of acquiring the pieces and what that means to you and have that in your collection. Yeah, I know because like sometimes I'll see comments of people like this is creepy and I'm like, maybe it is a little creepy, but I don't what they don't understand is that when you like what we were just saying to each other, how you know, you grow up and you, you find a sort of hope whatever it is you're going through in life. And when I was young, it was tough. So I found a sort of hope and that was through Marilyn and makeup. So also she defined this look. She used this makeup to create this iconic legend that we know now so to own that makeup and to preserve it not only preserves her memory but it shows how important important makeup is it's not just this oh let me make myself beautiful it can really create something more for me i like it more for art mm -hmm. for marilyn i know it created an icon so yes i don't want to swatch it i don't want to touch it i want to preserve it exactly as she last left it and i want it to be on display for everyone to see so again they can understand that there's so much more to makeup and we don't really have a makeup Makeup museum and we deserve mm. it look how much it's done for us for me it's a form of therapy but it's also it's a way of self-expression and yeah there's just so much i think that is is that goes into makeup so when people they don't understand most people do understand they get it like oh mm -hmm. you know she loves marilyn she loves makeup but for the people that don't understand that's what i want to convey it's 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 so much more than just seeing a little just a piece of an object it, yeah. it has a lot of meaning to it especially to me <laughs> <laughs> and that makes me think because I think what what Brick comes to my mind when I see someone like you acquiring these pieces, it's interesting because, you know, you saying it, it is more art for you. It's funny because I really think Marilyn, despite the public perception, this was a woman that was so brilliant at crafting a character and there is so much art in that so it'd be so curious to go back and have a conversation with her about what her relationship was with beauty and makeup in conjunction with that artistic presentation of herself which is exactly yeah. what your motivation is so it's very it's kismet in a way that someone like you would would acquire these pieces and end yeah. up there's something universally like meant to be about that. So <laughs> going from loving makeup when you were young and beauty and that transformation. So just give me a little bit of a history as far as the rise of your career. Like which steps did you take to pursue a career as a professional makeup artist transitioning from that adolescent love into, okay, this is what I'm going to do professionally. Yeah, I didn't really know you could be a makeup artist and from a pretty, well, I moved around a lot when I was a kid and, and mostly grew up in a small town. So being a makeup artist, that was so totally unheard of. And it wasn't until I discovered Bond's books and I basically, I've studied them. They were like the, the Bibles, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> every yeah. makeup artist has yes. to, I mean... <laughs> So I would, I, I needed a job. I got a job working at a long comb counter. I was 18. And um, I used to basically like, you know, those, like I said, a book was like my Bible. So I would kind of just take a customer and be like, can I try this look on you? Oh, I and I would that. use yeah, yeah. His, his books. And then I'd like a lot of times the customers loved the way it turned out. They'd like buy everything. I just only worked retail. I didn't know I necessarily had, um, a talent for makeup. I just loved it so much. And I loved playing with it on myself. So 10 years I worked in retail. I started at Lancome and then I moved to Mac and I worked in a few different lines but for literally 10 years in Texas and then in Ohio, I worked in retail. Mm. And then, um, I met someone who started working for Pat McGrath 
Mm-hmm. And she was also from Ohio and she worked for Mac and we became good friends and just stayed in touch for, for years. And then finally, you know, after all that time being a retail, I'm like, actually, I had tried to open a store with a friend who <laughs> it didn't turn out so well because then the friend took the store for herself and mm-hmm. I kind of lost it. But I, I came up with the concept, but yeah. I couldn't get the money. So she was able to get the money. So lesson learned there. I went, mm-hmm. you know, what am I doing here? Like this idea, this just creation, it, you know, it's... I just need to start over. And I just decided to get up, move to New York, went to New York. My friend, you know, got me on some shows with Pat McGrath and that sort of started everything. Cause it was like, I'd never been on a fashion show. I'd never, I started testing. I started, you know, reaching out to every single agency, every photographer, every, anybody that would like listen to me, you'd never get an email back. Cause I email yeah. everybody. But you just wanted to test. Of course, like I said, I got on the shows with Pat, but the shows only came twice a year in New York. So it, it was, you know, I got on the shows and then you'd sort of wait and starve. And yeah. I don't I don't want to go too much into that, but it was really, yeah. really hard in the yeah. beginning. Yeah. And I didn't have any money. So it was very tough, but I just kept on testing. I do everything for free. And then um, I kept working with Pat and then maybe a couple of years went by and then I went on full time with her. Did mm. that for like seven years. Wow. I was with her. Yeah. And then because I went to New York when I was 28, I'm 44 now. And I didn't go on my own until it was like 2016. So I was like almost 40 years old at that point. And, uh, you know, I had met Gigi, got in good with Gigi because we became good friends while I was working with Pat and I was doing her makeup Mm. all the time. And she recommended me to a Maybelline e-com job. Mm. It worked out really well. They loved it. Then I kept doing all the e-com for Maybelline. Mm. And then years of that, and then I started getting to do the ads, and then that turned into a contract. It's so, it's hard to sort of compact all of this. Of course. But... 10 years of retail is seven or more years of assisting. And then maybe a, you know, a couple of years of like trying really hard to get everything on my own. And, you know, after leaving assisting and then getting the big contract and the big magazines and working with the big models, Yeah, everything took forever to lead into that one small point where it was like, now I'm making money. Now I'm yes. getting the, the editorials. Yeah. Now I'm getting the respect. And yeah, then guess yeah. what? <laughs> and you got the shows, John Paul Gaultier's last show, Scaparelli. I mean, I got wow. to do some major things. And then COVID hit and everything changed. I know. (laughs) Everything changed. But everything changed in a way for the better for me because I started to do social media and I fell madly in love with it. And I still love it, even with some of the ups and downs that go on about it. Um, It has allowed me to be the director, the editor, the model, the filmmaker, the creative director, the the writer, you know, I literally can do everything that's in my head in that 30 seconds and allow people to sort of like share my crazy passion with me. And I I love it. I love it more than doing makeup. Wow. I can't believe I said that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, oh my God, there are so many like life lessons and everything you just said. And, and the first thing I want to touch on, just such a good lesson for people to maybe extract something from, especially talking about opening, opening the store with your friend. And I've been in situations where you are thinking about maybe going into business, someone or or working with somebody. And I think it's a, a symptom of getting older, but eventually something clicks where you really realize like, oh, okay, if I have a certain dream, if I want to get somewhere, I need to fully invest in me. I need to trust that I alone can do this. And once you kind of embrace that power, you do feel a different level of acceleration, almost a turbocharge to your drive and ambition. And that gives you the perseverance to do those jobs for free for years, to work the long hours, to put in that time because it's, there's no one else to take it on. There's no one else to deflect. There's no one else to distract you. And it's just you wanting to get to that finish line. This is what I think about you because Mm. I can see this same fire and hunger that was sort of in myself. You do it for the creativity, for the love, but you are not going to wait for anybody else to hand something to you. You've just got to take it on your own. Like for you watching you on TikTok, I love your TikToks. I see now you've started your YouTube channel, Mm -hmm. following you on YouTube. And then to see you do this, Mm -hmm. I know that you are, have taken this on your own. And you said, I am am going to do this because you obviously have a fire too, that you love doing this. Like this is creative for you. But if you don't, a lot of people out there are like, 
just waiting for something to happen. You cannot wait and you may starve and it may be hard, but if you want it, you have got to go after it. And even going back to Marilyn Monroe, she wasn't just a legend. It took her 10 years to even get noticed in the film industry. Exactly. So like, I'm so impressed with you. And that's the reason I wanted to talk to you is I can see we're very similar, but also of course we both love makeup, but everything you just said, you nailed it. Well, thank you. (laughs) That means the world. I have chills. Um, But, and it's true because, and I now going to the COVID thing and what you just said, it's interesting because yes, I went to cosmetology school when I was about 20 and I was going to do hair and I fell in love with makeup. And it was, for me, it was literally almost 10 years, nine and a half years of working in retail. Then when I went back to college, I don't know, I I, I went back for marketing and I was like, listen, I'm just going to work corporate cosmetics because I had kind of lost that fire in a way. I ended up when the pandemic hit, what made me do all this was sitting at home. And, And people always ask me for advice when it comes to social media. And I always tell them, you have to have something to say. Some, as long as you have something to say that nobody else is saying, you're in the bag. And that's why I started doing those comedy videos. And it ended up taking off. And you're right. It, it's And I always, as I'm sure you do as well, starting the podcast and uh, the other channels, that's the poor kid in me where I always say, like, when something good happens, I always... I need something else on the burner. You always want to give yourself those opportunities around. Don't put your eggs in one basket. And now going to the COVID thing, we were kind of that different where you were doing all that before. I was crying before COVID and then COVID hit. Do you want to get back into that more or where where does everything lie for you? Yeah, it's really crazy. Um, first off, I agree. The poor kid in both of us, because I think that makes you work harder. It yeah. sucks that it happened yeah. to us, but it does yes. make you work harder. But that was the thing. And speaking of working hard, you know, before COVID hit, I was traveling the world constantly. Sometimes I would spend thousands and thousands of dollars for me and my assistants to fly out to go do a show or an editorial or, and then, you know, it might, they might want natural makeup or, you know, maybe I didn't really like how the editorial trip, there'd just be so many things that I was like, what the hell is going on? I'm spending yeah. fortunes. I'm I'm never sleeping. I'm never on a proper diet. I'm constantly traveling everywhere. I'm sometimes having to go to a, a shoot at four in the morning. And I was so freaking exhausted. How many years had I been working nonstop, you know, um, yeah. since I was 18? Yeah. And, you know, so like, you know, 42 or 41 at that time. And I was just like, I'm just so tired. I wish the world would stop. And it fucking did. Yes. <laughs> It was crazy. Yeah. It was like, oh yeah. my god, hallelujah! Yeah, so yeah. I was, I was so happy for everything to stop. But what also happened was, it made me reflect on everything, and I started to think. You know, in this world of uh, in fashion and makeup, what we do is we work on editorial. So if you see the Vogue covers and you see uh, the, you know, the the editorials that are inside, we've done that for free for a very small credit, and I did it mm. for so many years. So I started to go. I don't want to work for free anymore because look how scary this is. All of a sudden COVID hit and like, what? Like my, my job stopped. I'm lucky because I have a contract with Maybelline. So I was okay. But think about all these artists yeah. out there who are like, they're hustling and getting somewhere yeah. and then boom, everything's taken from them. Yeah. Very, very scary stuff. And I started to realize like, I will not work for free anymore. I'm not going to go flying over to the shows anymore unless it not only is it a look, but it's a lot of money, which that never happens. You yeah. got to get well, both unless you're yeah. Pat McGrath. Yeah. Pat McGrath or Peter Phil. I love, you know, yeah. and so I, I just kind of said, I don't really know that I want to do this in the same way. I love doing makeup, but I don't want to do it in the way I did before. And I started dreaming about something else, you know, and when I, when I started to do the social stuff, I just needed to be creative in that moment. Didn't know it was going to go anywhere. Didn't know it was going to turn into anything. I never even looked at TikTok until what, a year ago. Mm-hmm. And I just started to, you know, have all this time on my hands and I needed to be creative for my own self. So when I would do these things and see people enjoy them, of course, when that gives you a boost, you're like, well, let me do another one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, but it's also like it wouldn't work unless you actually loved it, lived it, you know, yes. felt it. Yeah, I can't be like fake. So I love it so much. And I was doing collecting vintage makeup anyway. I just wasn't showing it to people because I didn't even know there was an interest. Yeah. So it all led into something. And then the more... 
that one, I, I could make a little bit of money from it sometimes. I make more money as a makeup artist, so I don't need to live off social media. But when you start to see the amount of money you can make for one hour of work compared to being on set for 18 hours, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it changes your perspective. And, and I'm 44, I'm tired, I'm old, and I don't really want to be on set for over 12 hours a day anymore, unless it's like when I'm working with Maybelline, won't do it yeah. for free. Yeah, I won't do favors for people anymore. Like, I've paid my dues. I want to make a lot of money. Yeah. And I want my TV show. And I want to keep doing social because I love it. So I yeah. now I focus on doing things I love versus just doing, um, just killing myself for, for, yeah, working so hard. I don't want to work so hard anymore. 100%. <laughs> Tell me about this TV show. We've done the sizzle. We have done the um, a small episode, like six minutes of, of an episode. Basically, I want to travel the world, sort of like an Anthony Bourdain traveling the world. Yes, and learning that's about exactly makeup. what I thought. Yeah, what that's exactly where it went. Yeah. yeah. It's funny Ooh. because Lisa, Lisa Eldridge Ooh, kind of that. did something that I know would be so good. Ooh. Lisa did something for BBC and it was so great. We got that glimpse. She did like three episodes and I was filming an interview when it launched. So there's a collective con- consciousness. Like we both have the same ideas out there. But I think the one difference between me and, and Lisa is uh, I think Lisa has this calm, sophisticated, you know, she, <laughs> she's a different, and me, I'm kind of crazy. And I cost and I don't taxes and yeah. I like to be over the top yeah. crazy makeup. Uh, but so I think I'll have a different perspective on the show. But yeah, I want to go to China and understand about, you know, this red makeup and learning about Han Fu and like Chinese mm-hmm. opera. And then, you know, go to Africa and learn about the Nuba tribe and how they would paint with just earth materials and do these amazing makeups. I mean, there is so much to impact. Talk about drag talk yeah. about 1920s jazz makeup just a simple red lipstick the amount of history behind red lipstick is mind-blowing yeah. it's so fun too yeah. so i i made the pitch um there's a couple of agents out there pitching the show um it hopefully it'll get picked up and it'll happen because i think i think it, it has to happen <laughs> it's, it's gonna happen that is such a brilliant yeah. idea i can see the entire thing around, like exactly when you brought it up i literally went to anthony bourdain of you in these places <laughs> And you're so good at just even what you when you talk about it online, uh, just the history of these uh, techniques and the products. And it, it's so fascinating because you have that educational background. And that that almost makes me wonder because I so many young people ask me and even me being a bridal makeup artist for the past couple of years, whenever we tried to have new kids come into the fold, it was really hard because they there's almost no place anymore to go get that job and get that hands-on experience with um, learning on other people. And, you know, sitting at home and doing it on yourself is fine, but the minute you start putting makeup on somebody else, it's a completely different animal. The entire perspective change, the dimension changes, and me getting my start at Sephora, I had really learned how to work with every brand, and that was in the Kim Kardashian era, so it was really that makeup, and I was blessed after that to go on with Burberry and Laura Mercier, which was a much more natural aesthetic, and get Mm -hmm. that kind of breath. But it's interesting because both of us being on social media, I almost am feeling like now where it's this tricky spot you're in where you want to be able to educate people when you come from a place of artistry experience and having this kind of career you have. And maybe this is the bitter in me talking, but notice a trend more where the brands and the industry is putting their eggs into the basket of people who are really becoming they're entertainers before they are makeup artists or they haven't worked on other people. And I think that has created a mindset in younger artists where they say, I'm not going to work for free, but right from the gate, like you're saying, <laughs> like where you, you, you have the right to say, I don't want to work for free because you did it for 20 years. Uh-huh. So, so my question being is like, where do you almost see the industry going where these uh-huh. younger people can learn on anybody but themselves in their bedroom. It's definitely changing, but I think if you're going to work in the fashion world or even like trying to get in with celebs, you'll have no choice but to do free stuff. It's just kind of is how it is. You have to build a portfolio in order to do that. You have to work on models and it'll be a model that's testing who's a new model and they're working for free. The photographer's working for free. You guys are just honing your skills. So if you really want to be like a, they call it a working makeup artist, yeah. then I don't think you'll have any choice but not to work for free. But I do see, I'm, I'm one of the few makeup artists that don't, 
a lot of people have this feeling of how they don't like what this is becoming as Mm -hmm. in they don't maybe respect someone who's on YouTube or someone who only does their own makeup. I feel completely different. I think mm. those these kids are smart as hell because yeah. they're not lugging around a 70 pound suitcase, you know? <laughs> yeah. Work smarter. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. for me, I was like, you know, like, damn, I wish years ago this was, you know, social media existed because I was doing my own makeup when I was working for Mac and doing crazy makeup. I could have, you know, been the uh, Jaclyn Hill or something. Yeah. And then I thought, well, what am I waiting for? Who cares if I'm in my 40s? Just do it, you know, and just to yeah. show what you love. And I always love vintage, but I can't do vintage stuff on every shoot that I do. I almost never get to do it, but I can yeah. do it on myself. Yes. So I think I think it's wonderful in a way that it's changing. I think it's great to know that now you can make opportunities for yourself in a different way because it's very, very hard to break into this industry. And I'm pretty lucky to where I got, but there is sort of that 1%, like when I mentioned Pat McGrath or Diane Kendall or Peter Phillips or um, Lucia Peroni, like there's some really amazing, huge makeup artists that made it to the, what we call like the 1%. Yeah. I luckily worked with Pat for many years, so I felt it. I lived it. Um, I never got to that level, but I got to get the contract and work with you know the big models, get the editors. I I know I did enough, and now what's next? And I think social media allowing us to have a different way to show makeup and our love for makeup. I think it's a great thing. So yeah, I, I don't know what exactly the kids are doing, but I think that they want to be social media stars than they than more than they want to be makeup artist in the old way. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It goes back to just the sitting down and get started. Yeah. Just sit down and get started. Yeah. Whatever you want to do, do you have to just do it. Because I think we spend so long trying to figure out what our first step is or where to go. And you're frozen and immobilized. And then you realize, no, even if I'm wrong, yeah. I just have to sit down and do it. You have to build those building blocks. And speaking to your experience when it comes to runway shows and editorial and commercial campaigns, I really wanted to ask you, what is your approach when it comes to the creative process? I mean, if you're going to do runway, you're going to go in for the test. So you'll go in like a week before, a few days before the actual show. You have a couple of hours, sometimes only two hours. And they tell you, here's the collection. Here's our idea, you know, or sometimes they know exactly the makeup they want. They'll literally show you, but that's pretty rare. Usually they just give you the idea. What do you think? You know, and then you kind of work together and you come up with the look. That's different. You, you know, you have a little more time to think about it before the show. But if you're doing an editorial, you come in that day, you're lucky if you get, you know, if they give you the brief, you can put together a sort of mood board so you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you go in there and you have no idea that they're like, oh, we want to cover the whole body in fish skin. I'm like, what? Like, yeah, didn't want to tell me that a couple of weeks ago so I could have prepared, (laughs) sending my assistants off to buy things. I'm like, get every single thing you can find. It's impossible sometimes. So um, it's all quite different, honestly. But, you know, my favorite is working on, like with, when, when I work with Maybelline or when you work with a makeup company in general, you go in and I'm doing, I, I do all the ads and all the commercials for Maybelline. So everything you see on TV, I've done that makeup, which is pretty fucking cool. I have to admit, yeah. But it's great because you go in and they, they really, they're spending millions here. So they have to think about where they're shooting, how they're shooting, how they want the makeup. It doesn't mean it always stays. We'll do the makeup as what they want. Then we see it on camera and then I'm on a sidewalk, like changing everything <laughs> happens all the time. But they know the product they're selling. So if it's a lip product, we know it's a lip focus. And we work together to make that product look the best. And I really love that kind of stuff because in a way, I'm celebrating makeup in that moment. And um, we're there for all one goal, which is about the makeup. When you're doing editorial, it's about the fashion. Usually it's not about the, the makeup unless you're doing beauty. So there's different approaches to every single thing. I will say in every approach that you do as a makeup artist, I know that there are some people that are they'll hold on to something like, no, I'm not changing the lip. I love the way that looks. You can't be that way in this industry. You have to really be open to your, the team around you. We're all working together. If a client says, "Mm, not really feeling that eyeliner, don't try to save the eyeliner. Just go, let's change it. And you, I'm quick. I will, I will do an eyeliner literally in seconds on a sidewalk. I've done it many times, but that comes from all the years of working on fashion shows Mm -hmm. Um, comes from all the years of working with Pat. I mean, you have to be quick. You can't second guess yourself. You have to just be confident and know what it's going to do. And you whack it on. And sometimes when it's not perfect is when it actually looks cooler. So sometimes doing it in that way is actually better. But yeah, there's, there's, there's so many different approaches, but, um, and, and they're all 
crazy. <laughs> I know. Well, how many times have you sat down to do your makeup and you have nine hours and you hate it and then you have 30 minutes and it's the best you've ever looked? <laughs> I would love to know out of everything that you've done, is there a look that comes to mind that is just something you're most proud of? Every time me and Gigi do a Met Gala together, it always is going to end up fun and pretty or interesting. But my favorite of all time is when we did the white eyelashes. I used um, uh. Goose by it Feathers. Yeah, and I glued on like one at a time and I made them like kind of sort of going like this. And they were so cool. And, you know, it wasn't about just being like perfectly beautiful and perfected. It was camp was the theme. So we got to go nuts and she let me do something a little extra and it was white eyelashes. Mm. But also people are like, those look so painful. And I'm like, no, they're literally light as a feather. They were feathers. <laughs> so wow. I just thought I finally got to be, not only was it, you know, I got to be innovative and do something really cool and fun. People loved it, but it was also on a grand stage. So even if I did Jean-Paul Gaultier, not everybody saw that, but I think everybody saw Gigi at the Met Gala in those white feather lashes. So that was a moment for me. I remember it well. <laughs> Yeah, it was wild. 100%. <laughs> yeah. When we had spoken earlier, you had mentioned to me when you started your TikTok career, you dealt with getting canceled. Right away. What happened? Oh. Well, you know, I collect vintage makeup. And I think a lot of people that saw this video, they didn't know that I had this literally over 5,000 pieces of, of mm -hmm. vintage products that I have my, um, an archivist actually working on where it's, there's a whole thing to it. It's not going to be very exciting when everyone's going to get to see this in person. So I started buying, you know, I was looking for ancient makeup pieces and I found, um, something in the shape of a horse. And then I found this spoon from ancient Egypt, you know, there's things you can buy online. A lot of people buy ancient products online at an auction, which is kind of wild, but a lot of people don't know about that. So I bought this spoon. I still question if it's actually real. I'm, I'm, I've been seeing them pop up. So now I'm starting to think it actually isn't real. And, um, but it doesn't matter. People saw it and they're like, why do you have this? And I'm kind of like, well, I collect vintage makeup. They're like, think I'm just some wackadoodle that, you know, it's just, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they yeah. knew to the extent that it was that I love these things. And anyway, it, people got upset. I understood why they were upset. And I made, you know, kind of an apology video. I contacted all of the museums in Egypt. I think it was four or three or four um, that I contacted. No one responded. I was like, mm. I want to send this spoon to you. And oh. no one responded. So I found out that nobody, I don't think that the museums are concerned with a spoon. They're more concerned with getting like the Boston Nefertiti or mm. the, um, the uh, Rosetta Stone, you know, things that are in Berlin and the British Museum. And these are the things that Egypt really wants back. But um, as far as I know, there seems to be a plethora of these sort of like cosmetic spoons. It was something I wanted to display in the museum and people were not happy about it. And it was a really strange and uncomfortable time because now I understood what it was like for a million people to tell you to go kill yourself. It's oh. clear to tell you that they hated oh you or that you're going to be cursed or they hope this bad things happen to you. You're like, well, I, what people don't know is that all these things that I've actually bought was because I, I have been approved for a, um, 5013C, mm. which is a nonprofit, which means all of these items will be on display for charity. So what mm. people don't understand is I'm actually was building this yeah. collection to help the world and they kind of tore me down for it. And it, mm. it, it, it sucked. It made you question, why do you want to help people if everyone out there um, can be so hateful? Mm. And without even, there was no real research into it. It was just like, we hate you. Mm. <laughs> and so it was scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing about social media. I mean, especially it makes sense that it happened maybe at the beginning of your TikTok career <laughs> because pretty quick. people don't have context. And nine times out of 10, they don't want context. No. no, they don't even want to do that research to figure out who that person is, what their intention is. It takes a while to establish that. And then even after you have it, you get the comments that you're like, do you know anything about me? Hi, you're clearly new here. Out of everything that you have, what are your, and across the board, and for those who don't know, you have some of the just most beautiful vintage perfumes and obviously makeup products and artifacts and vintage pieces, the perfumes. I love when you find the updated version and compare how similar the scent is. 
what are some pieces in your collection that just stand out to you as the most just excited to have in your collection? Well, I love any time that I can collect an, uh, beauty icons makeup or wig. So I have, of course, we have, I have a bunch of Marilyn Monroe stuff now. I think I have about eight pieces in total of Marilyn's and uh, I have some of Elizabeth Taylor's wigs. So I have one from mm. the movie Cleopatra and I have one from um, last time in Paris. Now I can't think of the name of it. Um, I have Mae West's wig and all oh. of her makeup and her eyelashes and everything. I have Amy Winehouse's makeup. Um, these are just the celeb stuff. I have all of Ann Miller. A lot of people don't know who Ann Miller was, oh. but oh my God, she loved her makeup. Oh, if you're a Ann stage Miller. boy, you love Ann Miller. Oh, she's yes. wonderful. <laughs> I don't think my mom showed me a movie in color until I was 15, I want to say. Everything we watched was old Fred Astaire, <gasps> Ann Miller, Danny Kaye, yeah. all the old. Yes, yeah. I know That's her well. That's why we get along too, because I, yes. know, I didn't say that in the beginning. I know it started with Marilyn Monroe, but then I fell in love with Jane Harlow, Joseph B. Baker, Marlena mm. Dietrich, you know, Ann Miller, the list goes on. And I started, I, I love all of these icons of beauty for me. Like they used, you know, makeup and hair to be, become these icons. So I, beyond just having like the celebrity stuff, I also have like a very intricate, like compacts. Like I have these opera glasses that one side is a powder and the other side is a lipstick and they're literally like glass shaped like glasses um i have god i have so many things all the bracelets the josephine baker you know that was made for her the um the flamande bracelets and their compacts with lipsticks inside and i have over five thousand pieces and there we're actually because my archivist has been working on putting all of this on online so pretty soon there'll be an online source for everyone to view right wow. now we only have about 200 pieces up it's such a lot i mean she's been working on this for sure. literally like eight months <laughs> it's such a process i have so many things but it's um one day uh since, you know, the nonprofit was approved and then the museum will come up probably in New York City, where I live in financial district, there will be in uh, the museum there and everyone will be able to view all of these pieces that I have and it will be so beautifully set up. And then all the profits will go to charity for children who who suffered like I did and like Marilyn did mm -hmm. for underprivileged children and for children. Yeah. I, I won't get too far into it. I'll announce it at one point, but I, it's going to, it's, it's, I want to leave. A, I've gone so much farther before I was like just collecting because of greedily for myself. Like, oh, I want to see this and smell this and try this. And, and, you know, I collected for myself and it grew into such a beast. Mm -hmm. So it, I realized over, you know, like two years ago that I had to turn this into something. So we've just been working on that to turn it into a proper museum. It's going to be sick. And it'll la leave a lasting legacy that will actually help people. And, yeah. and what else could I do in my life that could be better than that? You know, <laughs> I am so obsessed with you. It's not even funny. And I've never been more happy to hear that you're in New York City. I'm in New Jersey. Yeah. And so when this happens, you're I'm going to be VIP party. <laughs> first online. I cannot <laughs> wait. And I was going to ask you how the museum, how it's materializing, whether it's a dream or if it's really happening or if it's in the works. I, yeah. would, I love to hear that it's in the works. That's so exciting. And you are just so, <laughs> it is so amazing to speak with someone that covets this industry in such a way that is so deep into the history and the preservation, like you're saying, the legacy of it. Because I think for those of us that are a little bit older, we see makeup launches every 30 seconds and it's really become such a fast yeah. fashion kind of an industry. It's so phenomenal to have someone that is working so hard at your own expense, at your own time to preserve that entire era of history going back i can't even imagine how far and give people that value in where that came from and why we do what we do and it's so interesting because there's so many parallels speaking to the kevin aquan book for those who don't know making faces is his most famous one if you want to start with any but there's two total three he has the art of, he has the art of makeup as well it's a really big one and that came out first I have making faces and I have face forward. Face forward, face forward. And then what's the third? Art of makeup was his first one. It's really Art large. Of yeah. It's, it's, How do I not have that? Yeah, you should definitely find it. It's a little harder to find, but yeah, I think um, there's actually four in the end because then after he died, they made another book. It's like a red. Do you see what a psycho I am? Like, I know everything. 
Yeah. Do it as 117 pages. <laughs> no, I have no. Like, that's the obsession with makeup that people did so deep. You know, I collect vintage magazines. I collect books. I collect wigs. I collect makeup. Um, I co- collect the ephemera. So all the advertisements that surround that piece of makeup. I oh, also wow. collect that. So then when it's displayed, I spent over a million dollars on this collection. Wow. Like, uh, let's be real. People are always like, how do you have money? I'm like, I don't anymore. <laughs> I used to, but I spent it on my vintage collection. Yeah. <laughs> you know what just popped into my head, which is so funny and another reason I get along with you so well. And I forgot about this. Years ago, I was working with a friend and we were really researching what it would take to start our cosmetics line and developing makeup. And while we were doing it and planning it on my life, I really had said, well, I don't really know if I want to say it because I don't want anyone to steal it. Don't. <laughs> I'll cut this part out. <laughs> When I was thinking about it, researching 1900s, 1910s, 20s, 30s packaging and looking at that vintage packaging and I was saying how beautiful it would be to have a line now that all had that reminiscent packaging with original formulas, obviously, and, you know, contemporary, but all inspired by that era. And that was my six years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's just so funny to me, our relation. But the point I was making about Kevin Aquan, the relation between the two of you, even in those books, what I fell in love with, why I fell in love with him so much, not only his technique and what he was teaching, but how much he loved those stars. So much of the techniques he explained in those books, he was using at the time, contemporary celebrities, your shares, your Winona Ryder, your Barbara. Dream, Barbara. Yeah. But he was on so many of them, transforming them into those old 20s, 30s, 40s stars. And it was, in its own way, paying homage to yeah. that era. And you're so similar in that regard. <laughs> and I just think it's incredible. Yeah, you know, it, there's two things. I mean, one, I think that's why every time I do um, a TikTok video, I always like to like really change my look and my wig or my hair or like, you know, really do. And I think it must have been something to do with one, being in love with all of these different, you know, movie stars, but also uh, Kevin O'Quan and how he would do all these different looks. And I would always just try to emulate those looks. So I'm sure there's something to that. But also what I love about Kevin, he actually tried to bid on Marilyn Monroe's makeup case when it came <sighs> auction and Ripley's won, won it for over 250,000 oh. yeah um, I'll have an update on that at some point but <laughs> it was just interesting like so Kevin appreciated makeup you know mm. so much that he he wanted that I wish he would have won it but uh yeah, but yeah he was amazing it's it's he definitely both of us he <laughs> had a huge impact on both of us I can see oh yeah. um, you know I want to go back to two things actually that were in my mind one I just want to say you know for people who do makeup on themselves I think it's really great for makeup artists who work in the fashion industry or, or music or celeb or whatever mm. that they do try things on themselves and that's I think how I got good at makeup by trying yeah, stuff so for, well. for anybody out there maybe you don't want to share it with the world you don't want to see but I do think doing your own makeup will make you a better makeup artist but then of course working 100%. on everybody really makes you great mm-hmm. and um, the second thing was I don't think you should cut that out about the um, makeup line because let me tell you something. I have the same exact thought as you. I actually, I developed in the past like three years, I developed a line of makeup that's sort of based on vintage but made modern. That is a formula that they've used in the past but in a modern way with better pigment. I did all of this, gave it the most amazing name. It's such an amazing product. Unfortunately, I have not been able to get an investor to invest in somebody that hasn't proved that they can make sales. They mm. Investors want to invest after you yeah. launch and we need the money to launch. So I don't know if it'll ever come true, but I did make something, but you know, maybe it's not meant to be because right now, like you said, it's so oversaturated, but even though this is so different, what we've created, it's, Maybe it's too different. I don't know. We're in like a weird space. Like the beauty space is really, it's a lot of junk. A lot of junk happening lately. 100%. Not good. And that's the thing, is even doing what we do, and I feel bad sometimes, full transparency, I get PR. And what percent makes it from the PR boxes to my desk to film with compared to what I go out and buy? I'm being generous if I say 10% is PR and 90% is what I purchase because it has that cash grab 
junky. Yeah. Yeah. And have you noticed recently, if I have to see one more makeup collection that is with The Simpsons, The Muppets, Avatar, Ooh. Mickey Born. Mouse. The, Star Wars. <laughs> it's, yeah, the comedian me wants to do a stand-up bit about where is that Venn diagram overlapping? Where is that Simpsons fan who's also obsessed with makeup that's running to the store because there's a makeup collection with it? It's so out of control, these collabs. It's like people have are so out of ideas that the easiest thing for them to do is a cash grab with like doing a collab. And like most of it, it's like, like, let's be honest, when, you know, Pat came up that palette, it was a sticker on top. People like read her to filth for that Star Wars thing. Mm. For me, I'm like, I don't really care about Star Wars, but I get it. You know, when Bessame did like a Marilyn the Royal collection, I bought that, of course, you know, so I kind of understand uh. it. But then I also feel like, yes, are we now like, is everybody becoming the, sh the sh what is it called? Shen or shine of makeup that we're just going to keep throwing these silly little collabs out there. I do feel it's junk. I feel like we're just polluting the world with a bunch of stuff that we don't need. I, it mm -hmm. is just so out of control let's you know save the money and work on innovation work on you yes. know even like i i just thought i thought everything is amaya has made but the more i think about it, it's like these are limited edition and they're they're what are you going to do with these once it's gone they're these beautiful like fun packages but then what mm -hmm. like where does it go so yeah. like if it's not refillable or it's not either made from recyclable or compostable or at this day and age i don't think you see why I even bother i don't know yeah it's just too much. And also in a way, like I've started feeling like here I am promoting a lot of this like new stuff. So I'm kind of part of the problem too. So I took a little bit of a step back from that. And I started, I promote all the vintage stuff, you know, not like you can use all of it, but like, let's keep parts of things that are history and that deserve a place to be seen. And let's maybe stop with all the like, junk and the plastic and the, another red lipstick, another red lipstick, another red lipstick. <laughs> like, wait, wait, let's just work, you know, focus on innovation, less launches, more innovation. Yeah. I don't know. I think yeah. so personally, yeah. but, but I've been doing this for a long time. So I've been seeing makeup for a very long time. So maybe I'm like, you, you said before, like a little bitter about it, but I, I think it's kind of, yeah, I don't know. No, I think it's out sure. of control. So you should do a little comedy bit about that. I'd love to see it. I'm waiting for someone <laughs> to say it. <laughs> it's just wild to me. And I think the positive aspect that we're talking about as recently as 10 years ago, there was that huge division between the 1% and everybody down here. And I think the beauty of social media is that we're having so many more people who, like yourself, have risen through using social media to a certain place where you can leverage that in a way to be able to come out with a brand, to be able to come out with a museum, bigger projects that now we have those brands by people who have experience, makeup artists, and and I hope it goes in that direction. It's sad. It's overwhelming from our point of view because I even, I laugh at myself. When I'm reviewing a new foundation and one came out the week before, I'm like, it's a little, like, a little different, but... <laughs> It's 1% better or worse. It's so much. <laughs> and how do you balance it? Because I would love for my content to be all education focused, how to do something. But sadly, we are fighting those algorithms where I think the algorithm prioritizes those wet and wild came out with a lipstick that has spikes on it or whatever that you put on your toes. <laughs> that's the thing that's going to get views. And it's in every industry. But yeah. how do you deal with that? Well, first, you know, I guess I still have a thought when I go back to just like makeup lines. Uh, I just want to say, you know, um, for me, this is this is not answering your question right now, but I will. <laughs> I just want to say because I mentioned is Maya, and I, I love seeing makeup artists become successful and come mm -hmm. out with their own brands because I do I do think if there is any, any innovation, it's going to be through makeup artists, and I'm really tired of all the celeb makeup brands, oh. but. Uh, yeah, so I, I should say it's great that I just kind of said something bad, but I want to say it's great. I, I think it's great she's come out with a brand, but maybe we just have to make things more sustainable. But anyway, yeah. so back to so back to the yeah. I don't know. It's it's hard to say. Like I, there's a lot of people that I like. I love watching like new reviews, so I get it. You know, like I I I'm part of the problem. I like watching all the reviews of the new makeup, but and I like educational content too. But yeah, you're right. Like the, what gets me always, especially on TikTok comedy you know mm -hmm. you see it your numbers yeah. uh comedy gets me and um also sort of you know it, when there's a shock and an awe which i guess that's kind of what i do but 
not not by it's sort of by accident because if I'm crushing up a, a rock from you know that I think you know that I know was used during like ancient Egyptian times, I'm just showing people a little bit of an education, yeah. but it seems shocking to them, you know, because maybe they've never seen it before. But anyway, it's it's uh it's hard because yeah, the educational content. I know what you mean. The numbers aren't there, so you start to be like, well, why even you know bother with it? Mm-hmm. But if you enjoy it. I think uh, I think I said to you too, like you know, post what you like. The people that follow you all the time, they'll be there to support, and they want to see it. And then do your little explosive, you know, big viral hits. Because mm-hmm. yeah, I, I noticed just posting a lot, like posting every day, kind of helps the follower increase, and and you continue to get views on those old videos. But you know, just doing constant viral videos all the time, it doesn't actually. I don't see a huge jump in followers. I think it's more being consistent is actually what gets you the following. So I said, just post. Well, that's why I find your content so brilliant because it has that X factor. It has the, you're starting a video with, this is the lipstick Marilyn Monroe war. That is very different, than, very different than someone starting a video saying, I'm going to put my contour on with a fork. <laughs> Those are on two different planets. You've captured that X factor without <laughs> compromising what you want to say and what you want to do, which is what I think is so brilliant. Now looking into the future, you have the museum in the works, you have the TV show in the works, your social media is absolutely incredible. Having gone from traveling as a global artist doing now to doing TikTok and social media in general, what lies ahead? Where do you want to go when in the coming years? To be honest, I've kind of taken a step back from the makeup artist world other than what I'm, you know, having my contract, like shooting stuff that I'm kind of getting paid to do. I've really kind of said no to everything. And I've taken such a step back that I've, I've put so much focus into social media because I know when the museum launches, the best thing I can have to promote this wonderful, you know, Willy Wonka factory of makeup will be <laughs> through my social media. So I understand that there's so much stress strength and power in social media. And I also understand if I really do ever, you know, if, if the makeup line ever does drop one day, having that social media, is just free marketing, but you mm-hmm. know, it, you have people that support you and understand you and they will be interested in what you have to say in the makeup space. Yeah. So I think it's important to keep focusing on the, the social, but also because I love it. So I just, I'm really tired of it, you know, the whole like set life and I'm just ready to move to something else. So my focus will be continue to be on social media and, if this TV show, and if it, even if the TV show doesn't get picked up, I'm going to focus on YouTube or something because I just have a uh, lot to say. <laughs> so I'm going to like do what I can and I'll hopefully continue to work with Maybelline, you know, until, until they don't want me anymore. So I, cause I, I really, I enjoy it. So that's basically where I'm going to put my focus, but I, yeah, I'm not really doing, I don't want to be a, a makeup artist in the old sense mm-hmm. of the word anymore. Yeah. yeah which is kind of crazy. (laughs) Well, let me tell you, everything you're doing is just incredible. It is so unique. It is so refreshing, even from someone who is in makeup, but obviously people who aren't just find such a value in knowledge and expertise in everything that you're doing. And I cannot wait for everything you come out with. Cause like I said, I'm going to be first in line. I am just so enamored by you. Thank you. I cannot thank you enough for talking with me today. I feel the same way about you. Like I love your content. I love what you're doing. And I love, you know, that you, you can find the humor in makeup and that's what you specialize in too, I think. And also just your love for makeup. So just being able to talk with you today is really it was so much fun for me. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you. Well, Tell everybody where they can find you. Yeah, uh, my TikTok, my Instagram, and my YouTube is all at Erin Parsons Makeup. E R I N P A R S O N S. Erin Parsons Makeup. Even my name says makeup. Everything about me is makeup. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I <laughs> thank can't. You. This was a dream. Thank you. It was really fun. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Beautiful and Bothered with me, Johnny Ross. Stay tuned. Next Monday, we have a brand new episode with the fabulous pop musician. He is unbelievable. The one and only Z Machine. As always, I can't thank you enough for choosing to spend this time together each week. Make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to the official Beautiful and Bothered YouTube channel for video episodes every Monday. And if you can, give us a little five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. Wherever you are, I hope you are a happy, safe, and healthy. And remember, you are beautiful.